Hi, we continue in 1 Samuel 13 today after Jonathan has poked the Philistine bear by attacking them single-handedly or practically single-handedly. And we see in verse 5 here, the Philistines are responding. And so one of the questions is, what will Saul do given this vital situation, even desperate situation that he's faced with, uh, his first battle as king where he's faced with the Philistines. We saw that in chapter 11, he acted like a judge in defeating the Ammonites, um, uh, echoing many passages from judges and was successful. Uh, but now in this second test, he has not initiated it. Uh, Jonathan, who we don't yet know is Saul's son, has initiated it and we face the situation we have here. So on the right side of the screen, we've been following from 1 Samuel 11 to 15, uh, this section where Saul's kingship is tested and especially tested by Samuel here in chapter 13 and again in chapter 15, but also by Jonathan and Saul's oath not to eat in chapter 14 as a little triptych. Uh, if you're not familiar with this section, I really encourage you to go back and watch the introduction to 1 Samuel 11 to 15 videos so you can see some of the issues that, that we're facing here. Among Yahweh and the people of Israel and Saul and Samuel over authority and over kingship. Um, but if you're familiar with those, welcome back here where we face this tough situation. So we're going to be looking at this this section here, 13, 5 to 10, uh, in the middle of this. And I'm going to bring up the atlas because we certainly have to see where uh, where this is taking place. And some of it is taking place in a sarcastic location, which we'll see in just a second. So um, the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel. So going back a verse to where we uh, where we left off, we can see that when Israel had heard that Saul had, had defeated, or at least had attacked the garrison, the Philistines, who are housed right here. Uh, in other words, they have a, a fort or occupying force here uh, in Gibeah. Um, that Israel had become odious or stank to the Philistines, the people were called out to Saul at Gilgal. So Saul's with the people at Gilgal, and meanwhile, here's what we see at the Philistines. They gather to fight with Israel, and the, the newer R, RSV here has 30,000 chariots, but as Falkman uh, notes in a footnote, 30,000 chariots is too fantastic for the sober and realistic style of the books of Samuel. 3,000 is exactly the number, which is the correct ratio to 6,000 parasim, which is a word for horsemen here, because each chariot carries two men. So assuming that's a mistake in copying, 3,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, but troops like the sand of the seashore in multitude. So having uh, Saul with his 2,000 and Jonathan with his 1,000 troops, now they're suddenly completely overwhelmed uh, by the Philistines. And not only by Philistine numbers, but the very thing that led the Israelites to want to have a king in the first place is Philistine iron-wheeled chariots and horsemen, which are obviously a great threat. And as we'll see later in the chapter, the narrator saving it for suspense, according to the, the narrator, the Philistines control access to sharpening and creating of any kind of iron instruments, um, like uh, knives and swords and things like that. So an even further disadvantage to the Israelites that we'll see later. But for now, it's simply outnumbered and outmanned in terms of uh, military equipment here with horsemen and uh, chariots. And it says, um, they camp, came up and camped at Mishmash, which is here, to the east of Beth Avon. And if you look on at Bible atlases and things, you don't see Beth Avon because Beth Avon is a little bit of a joke here. Um, it's a nasty way of referring to Bethel, uh, especially by later editors. So we see here that Beth Avon means house of evil, although it doesn't have to mean evil. It can mean house of folly or things like that as well. Um, but to highlight that it's, a, it's the same word, that this house of evil is not a real place, apart from the fact that who would name your place? house of evil. That's plainly a naming that somebody else is putting on it. It really is talking about um, uh, Bethel. And Bethel is considered a house of evil because it's the place where monarchy began in the north. Um, not here in this scene, but in the divided monarchy where Jeroboam took the Israelites in rebellion against uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam in the book of First Kings and establishes um, uh, isolated places in the north at Dan and the south at Bethel to be shrines to indicate that his understanding is God isn't just in one place like in Jerusalem, but from the north to the south. And Bethel is one of those places, and what's described as um, having built there are two uh, golden something, whether they're cows or oxen or something, it depends on translation, but that's going to be important as we see. Because let's look at a couple of echoes here of Beth Haven. So especially from the prophet Hosea. So we see this in Hosea 4.15. Though you play the whore, O Israel, do not let Judah become guilty. Notice referring to the two kingdoms separately. Do not enter into Gilgal or go up to Beth Haven and do not swear as Yahweh lives. 
Uh, but later in Hosea, we see that it very specifically means Bethel, because we see here in Hosea 10.5, the inhabitants of Samaria tremble for the calf of beth -Aven. So not only was Bethel uh, a major city, and what later, after Israel um, is, loses its name and becomes Samaria, with its capital in Samaria, a little farther north, but the calf of beth -Aven is clearly referring to Jeroboam's uh, shrine. Um, in Exodus 32, you see the story of the classic golden calves. So this is a nasty name for Bethel, um, which we see right here, uh, otherwise known as House of God. And from the Deuteronomistic perspective, Bethel was a, a, a foreign place, an evil place. And you see that especially in 2 Kings 22 and 23, Josiah's reform. Not because it had foreign people there, but because it either had foreign gods or worshipped Yahweh outside of Jerusalem, which became very important later. But there is no Jerusalem in the story yet. It's just simply House of Evil. So that's where the Philistines are, and the Israelites respond to that, understandably, with great fear. And so we see here, only at the scene, end of the scene, do we discover the Israelites are defenseless. But when the Israelites saw, notice how that's different than what they heard. Last uh, section in 13, 1-4, we saw the verb for hear, um, Shema, three times. So this is what they saw, but of course it's only metaphorically seeing. And two words here, they were in distress, or literally they're in a tight spot, Zarlov, uh, means a narrow spot, and that's both literally so, as they're in the caves and amongst the rocks in a tight spot, but also obviously politically in a tight spot with the Philistines all around. For the troops were hard-pressed, and uh, the Hebrew word nigas here is only used one other time. Translated in the New Revised Standard in 1424 is committed a rash act, um, but other translations, as we'll see there, use something like hard-pressed in a similar way here. So they're in a tight place, and they're hard-pressed, and they begin to hide themselves every, everywhere they can. And to show you what that would look like, let's look at a couple of pictures of Israel. We can't really see the, the rocks and hills and such in this immediate area because it's populated now and developed. But we can see it in a couple of places to illustrate um, that this is much of the terrain of Israel, north and south. So in the north around the Sea of Galilee is Mount Erbal, which the later Jewish historian Josephus notes uh, the Israelites hid themselves in rocks and caves from the Romans there, even to the point of death. Uh, and then in the south, of course, the Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, but similarly where folks could hide there. So in these limestone geology, there are lots of, of caves and holes and places one can climb. And notice that the sequence here of hiding here from caves and holes and rocks, three natural things, and then two human-made things. The, the translation tomb is overdetermined here for this word, which can mean any underground chamber or excavation. And its only other use in the Masoretic text here back in Judges is um, for stronghold. So really, it refers to any kind of uh, human dug place. It's hard to imagine that they would be uh, hiding in tombs with the dead bodies were in, which would be unclean for anybody, even if they didn't have specific rules. And then it's here in cisterns and wells, and that's only um, one other time in the Deuteronomistic history earlier. And then here in 1 Samuel 19, we'll see when we get there how that's echoing this scene. So they're terrified. Um, this scene, by the way, is curiously echoed uh, into the New Testament here in Revelation 6, 15 and 16, um, where the people hide from the wrath of the Lamb, um, not from the Philistines. So they're hiding everywhere they can. They're not being defensive. And they, we hear some don't hide, but they escape. And this is a rare use for the narrator of Hebrews. We saw uh, Saul calling uh, some of the people Hebrews last time, and I referred briefly to uh, Meyer Sternberg's magisterial and long book, Hebrews Between Cultures. And I said I'd refer to it more later, and I will when we get to the third reference in chapter 14, which holds it all together. Um, and we can see who the, this text means by Hebrews. But plainly, Hebrews is not a synonym for Israelites. It's referring to a different group. It literally means crossers. And you can see something interesting in the Hebrew here if I, I bring this up in verse 7. So literally, crossers crossed. And you can see this uh, here from the Hebrew. Again, even if you can't read it, you can see the similarities of letters. So the va, the first letter here is and, and you can see that these consonants here match exactly these consonants for the verb to cross over, because the word Hebrew means the crossers. It's, it's a derogatory term suggesting they're foreigners, that they crossed over uh, a boundary or water from one place to another, specifically the Jordan River, historically. Much like Mexicans crossing the Rio Grande would be pejoratively called wetbacks, um, although most don't come in the Rio Grande nowadays, they come across the border um, through other places like Tijuana. Um, but that certainly sense that they're foreigners, that they've crossed over is the implication here. So the narrator using that is talking talking about not the Israelites, um, who we'll see elsewhere, but a group of people who've become traitors, basically people who've, who've quit and left and gone elsewhere. And so we see in the map, 
um, that they've crossed the Jordan River here the other direction. Um, and this is expressing, of course, ignominious uh, direction because they're supposed to be crossing the river this way, um, this way, coming out of Deuteronomy and settling in the land after the wilderness sojourn out of Egypt. So the crossers cross the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Um, um, Gad is one of the tribal names, but here uh, presented as, uh, it's the same as uh, Gilead. This map doesn't even show Gad as a place at this time period. It's an unusual use here. Um, Saul was still at Gilgal, so Saul is still here. And it says, all the people followed him trembling. So while these Hebrews are crossing here, the other people referred to earlier as Israelites are now gathering with Saul trembling here. Um, it's a very strong word, um, hardu, and it's echoed a few times. Uh, and it's showing that the people are obviously terrified here. Um, whether these are the same people who hid in the caves and holes and they came out, uh, or whether this is another group at Gilgal, um, but it does say all the people followed him. So it does suggest that the people somehow left their holes and caves and uh, followed him into Gilgal. And now he's waiting. Uh, so we can imagine the tension here. The Philistines are all gathered in un inconceivable numbers, and Saul has, at most 2,000, we'll see later that there's few, way fewer than that, uh, people waiting for something. But what? What we're told here is he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, which relates back to uh, ten six as we or ten eight rather, um, as we'll look at in a second. As Falkelman says about this, this is this section introduces the key text about Saul's decline around the question, who is to listen, read, obey, whom? And we'll see how that plays out in the next video. So he waited seven days, and this is, uh, most scholars take it as the recollection of 10.8. But as Falkelman notes, 10.8 contains nothing to foreshadow the context in which Saul's wait in Gilgal is to take place. The context of chapter 13 now makes the order into a veritable and terrible trial, which is to say, um, Saul, uh, Samuel made it sound like it's just a peaceful waiting until Saul, until Samuel shows up, not that he's doing that while the Philistines are mustering. Sumara suggests that the link isn't as obvious as most scholars seem to take. I won't go through the details here, but he does note that many years separate the two events, so it's not clear exactly how long. And so maybe there was a traditional ritual to wait on Samuel. That seems unlikely given that the narrator writes at the time appointed by Samuel. Um, but if we are associating it with the same event in chapter 10, it's a long time that Saul's been holding that message uh, in place here, and now he's finding himself there seeking to carry it out. So he waits those seven days, but meanwhile, Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people began to slip away. And the, the word here in slip away, viapis, from the a word that's unpronounceable without um, vowels, means to scatter, and is used often in the Deuteronomistic history as an exilic expression. For example, this from early in Deuteronomy, in chapter 4, verse 27, we hear, Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples, only a few of you will be left among the nations where Yahweh will lead you. And at the other end of Deuteronomy, in chapter 30, we hear this, Then Yahweh your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, gathering you again from all the peoples among whom Yahweh your God has scattered you. So plainly, those two places in Deuteronomy are suggesting an exilic and eventual post-exilic context for this slipping away or scattering. Slipping away from Yahweh there, but here slipping away from Saul. But suggesting that the monarchy, of course, will, is exactly what slips away when exile happens at the end of the Deuteronomistic history, at the conclusion conclusion of second, the book of Second Kings. So while the people are trembling and, and, and he's losing them, what is he to do? So he does the one thing that he knows to do. Um, Saul said, we're not sure who he's saying it to, bring the burnt offering here to me and the offerings of well-being. Um, this combination is from what uh, Samuel offered, ordered him to do. But let's look at a couple other examples of this so we can see, um, at least one, so we can see how uh, this might be heard by the audience, especially this from Judges 20, which is exactly in the middle of the, the battle over the concubine with the, between the Benjaminites and the Israelites at, at Gibeah. So it's several times that that bad scene has been echoed and Saul is associated with it. So here we hear this from Judges 20, 26. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went back to Bethel, notice that Bethel, and wept. Sitting there before Yahweh, they fasted that day until evening. Then they offered burnt offerings and sacrifices of well-being before Yahweh, 
before asking if it was time to go up and fight against the Benjaminites again. So there already is a tradition in Judges of offering burnt ac offerings and sacrifices of well-being as a means of uh, preparing for uh, asking Yahweh if it's a time to go into battle. But Saul's not asking Yahweh, he's just waiting for Samuel here. Um, and he's trying to keep the people uh, from running away completely. So in the midst of this situation, we see this. And as soon as is perhaps an over-translation here, um, of the Hebrew um, suggesting not necessarily the issue of time, but just when he completed the offering. So we could translate this as Saul finished offering, Samuel arrived. Um, right at that moment, and new RSV as so often does omits the Behenna, and behold, allowing us to highlight this is the turning point here. So after waiting, um, you know, a terrible seven days, as soon as he did that, Samuel arrives. And uh, it does seem to leave it uh, as if Samuel is just waiting behind a tree there to catch Saul doing this to see if how long he would wait um, for the late Samuel um, uh, to to show up later. Later in the book, we'll see the late Samuel as in the dead Samuel, um, but that's not until way later. And Saul went out to meet him and to bless him. Um, Labarako here, which will, he will do again in chapter 15. Uh, and as some commentators have noticed, Saul trying to take on the priestly role that Samuel has already claimed to offer blessing. So what will happen in this tense moment as Samuel arrives and Saul has already offered the burnt offerings? We'll see you next time. See you then. Bye-bye.